Hey, Talking Cars fans, we really love making Talking Cars each week, but we want to make sure you enjoy it as much as we do. That's why we've created a survey to find out what you like best about the show, what you want more of, and what we can improve on. Go to cr.org slash Talking Cars survey and let us know how we can make the podcast better. We really want to be your favorite automotive podcast, and your responses can help make that happen. Thank you for your help and enjoy the show. We talk about our first impressions of the 2020 Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport, the cancellation of the Geneva Auto Show, and do manufacturer's warranties extend when you're buying a used car? Next on Talking Cars. Hi, and welcome to Talking Cars. I'm Jennifer Stockberger. I'm Keith Barry. I'm Mike Quincy. So as of this taping, what's going on in the world, really, is mm. this spread of the coronavirus. Um, who would have ever thought it would affect things so drastically like the stock markets, et cetera? But what it really, how it relates to cars is they recently canceled the Geneva Auto Show mm -hmm. for risk of large crowds, the location, et cetera. Um, and with the New York Auto Show right around the corner, literally, it got us talking about how the auto show has changed, how the introduction of cars has hmm. changed. Keith, any thoughts there? Yeah, so it's interesting. So Geneva kind of turned into, over recent years, the show where supercars came out and these cars that nobody could afford, these thousand <laughs> horsepower, tour de forces of engineering. K Koenigsegg, which I still can't spell. Right. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. There are lots of vowels in there. Uh, and But they made this incredible, you know, four-door, four-seater, uh, gullwing door kind of concept that, yeah. that no one got to see except for online because the auto show was closed. Right. Uh, New York sent out something the other day that said, uh, uh, you know, we're going to be having lots of hand sanitizers, but the show's still on. Right. And that may change. I mean, Geneva was on up until the last minute, but it kind of shows that we don't necessarily need to have these big, big shows where yeah. everyone comes into the same place. All the automakers are competing for attention. Right. So, you know, it, I think it started with Apple. Apple had their own event. They don't go to CES or at the time Comdex or the yep. big the big trade shows. They wanted to own that news cycle. Yeah. And if you're, you know, Volvo, Mercedes, BMW, you're all competing to have the world learn about your latest concept on the same exact day. Why would you do that when right. you could just own another day? So it may this may be the it, sort of the the death of the the auto show. Well, they've yeah. already seen attendance waver oh, in yeah. some of them, and they've shifted times of the year. We've seen a shift hmm. more to LA than Detroit. Frankfurt's moving yeah. to Munich. Well, right. the auto show, not the city. Well, and, and, and Detroit, <laughs> Detroit is yeah. Detroit is moving to, to June. Yeah. Right. Instead of you know the the nice weather that we always have in, in January. January in yeah. Detroit. Where it was competing against CES and it was backing up against these other shows. Yeah. Yeah. I still think they do speak to. Um, just consumers' love of cars, just wanting to see them. Mm. Well, right, yeah, yeah. And a clarification, I mean, uh, maybe the, the automakers' uh, attendance of the auto shows are, are coming down. Some some car makers are choosing not to come to shows. I right. think that's what you were referring to before. Yeah, but, Mercedes but, pulled out but, from but a the, lot but of the them. But yeah. the public is still coming to auto shows. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the attendance is still really Despite strong. Despite the availability of all the online information, right. Right. galleries, yeah. mm. but, but But they're looking at it as, as buyers and, and from an automotive uh, manufacturing perspective. I mean, this, these things right. cost a lot of money yeah. mm. uh, to, to stage these things. Staff. I mean, they're hiring, you know, A-list musicians to introduce yeah. their vehicles I during, during Bruce the press Hornsby. days. <laughs> you know? um, and, and so it, it, it costs them a lot of money. So maybe they're not only yeah. they're considering the health hazards of doing, you know, auto right. shows, right. then maybe they're looking at it from a financial perspective. Right. Which yeah. would they have in the past too. I still think to people, the, you know, you can get all glean all the information from from the internet, but to get in a car and sit in it and touch it and feel it, it and obviously yeah. still has. We've been seeing feel. the local shows are starting to do test drives, and these are shows that aren't supported necessarily by the automakers, but they're supported by local dealers. Right. And they're these smaller shows. They're at like the Hartford Convention Center. Right. Yep, they're at yep. yeah, they're at smaller places, mm -hmm. and people can still go to those. And without the pressure of a dealer breathing down your neck, you can try out cars from a bunch of different brands. And then, uh, you know, go on to decide. And you can find out, are these seats comfortable? Do mm -hmm. I like the, the feel of the interior? Yeah. 
Yeah. And those are typically production cars. You don't see a yes. lot of concepts right. at and, those. And, and, and so I think, it's, it's what's on the lot. Yeah. I think the origin yeah. of the auto show was to help local dealers. Yeah. That, mm. that was, that was it, it be, before it became this big multinational right. concept car thing. But it is well, a big deal. To, stop shopping. Yeah. Right. It, but it is a big deal to cancel it. I mean, I know we were talking about LA. They had a fire at one of their auto shows in the in, in the 19 teens and they just moved it down the street. Right. <laughs> so it was, it was too big to cancel. Yeah. Right. yeah. So canceling yeah. these shows, this is, yeah, you know, is, I don't think it's, it, it's, it's sort of an inevitability that's being accelerated, I think. By the coronavirus. Yeah. Right. So yeah. we'll, so we'll see what happens in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, very interesting. We'll see yeah. if we're covering it remotely. Who would have thought, you know, in the big picture, how a health issue would have so many repercussions. Yeah. One of the cool doesn't. things is that because of all of this stuff was already set up there, some of the brands turned it into a new opportunity to debut their cars that were actually uh, more than just prototypes that could actually drive. Ah. And they debuted them by driving back to headquarters in Europe. So I know yeah. like Morgan did that yeah, and they cool. turned it into and follow along online. And yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, it's- When life gives you lemons? Yep, well, drive a Morgan. And of course, yeah. that's what our that's what our crack video team would do. Of course, yeah. like, oh, we had, we messed up. So, oh, let's let's pick up the camera. They wouldn't mess up. Yeah, oh, of course, not. exactly. <laughs> they don't mess up. All right. Anyway. <laughs> so, speaking of new cars, we had our first chance to drive the 2020 Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport. Mm -hmm. And Keith, I know you wrote the first drive. Um, what's some specs on this car? Yeah. So the Volkswagen <laughs> Atlas is a big SUV with three rows, seat mm -hmm. seven. The Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport. Volkswagen kind of melted the end off of it to make it apparently look sporty. Yes, um, that's you, the word sport. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so basically it's the same car uh, up front as a, a sort of loaded version mm -hmm. of the Atlas. The interior feels a lot like the Volkswagen Arteon, except it only seats five. Right. It loses 19 cubic feet of cargo space. Um, so it's, it's less utility, more sport. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that. Right. Um, but there are two engine choices. There's a two liter, four cylinder turbo or 3.6 liter, uh, V6. The only transmission is an eight speed automatic. We have, um, on the one that we're renting from Volkswagen right, right now, uh, is the two liter, four cylinder turbo. Yep. Um, that's the, that's the car. I mean, if you want to learn more about it, read our review of the regular Atlas because a lot of the a lot of it a lot is of very very similar. Same, so and that's kind of as some you of can my thoughts, as but... you can tell by some of the intonation I've been giving this, <laughs> I have feelings about this car, and those feelings are. Well, Let's get to that. Okay. <laughs> Let's. Why I don't want to step on anyone's toes. All right, why don't, so we'll why don't you? My, you yeah. keep that for a yeah, second. Yeah, I'm going to stew Mike, over here. Thoughts on the cross yeah. um, My thought is that mm. it's it's yet another auto uh, manufacturer that needs another version of an SUV. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, and slicing and dicing it thinner and thinner and thinner. Uh, I don't know how. Uh, how many SUVs the public can buy. I mean, obviously they're still popular, uh, but anyway, driving uh, the Atlas Cross Sport, uh, I thought the four-cylinder turbo was surprisingly engaging. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I was pleased to learn that it, it I thought it was the V6. Yeah, that's, I didn't mm, know. That's how good it I is. I had to go look. So it's mm -hmm. responsive. It feels kind of light Agreed. on its feet. Um, I think I thought the, the transmission was super smooth, good good ride, good handling. Um, I, again, I'm I'm not sure that we we need another SUV and 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 we were I remember this 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 reminded me of when we first started talking about the Honda Passport, another two row SUV, mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, our colleagues with with smaller children was like, oh three, it doesn't have three rows and that's terrible, blah blah blah. I have no use for third row seat in my life right now. Right. I'm never using a third row. Right. So uh, the vehicle, so the vehicles like the Passport, and I guess the Atlas Cross Sport totally fit into my life, and and they're they're very useful. But you know that being said, I'm I'm also more of a fan of, of sedans these days than SUVs. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I said you know you talk about needing another SUV. I do think Volkswagen needed this. You know the Touareg died mm -hmm. off and they didn't have a five row larger cargo they had the tiguan right. and they had the atlas they in my mind they needed this um cross sport tucked in there between the two to compete with passports and mm -hmm. other five row or, or five seaters so i i agree with you i was pleasantly surprised with the with the turbo four i thought it was great i think they've kept to your point Again, I talk about, you know, having adult sized passengers all the time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of room in yep. there, just like there was in the Atlas. Um, I think it's 
you know, the, where they lost is cargo. Mm-hmm. And I'm not mm-hmm. sure, it, it does look sportier, but I'm not a fan of that rear slope. I think it just robs cargo. It robs visibility in a lot of cases, that yeah. whole styling cue. Um, couple things there. I said, you know, we really liked the Atlas. It was hurt by some reliability mm-hmm. issues in our overall score, but if it can cash in on the Atlas success. It was a good seller for Volkswagen. Right. Um, then I think it's doing a good thing. Standard safety, automatic emergency braking, forward collision warning, including pedestrian detection, blind spot warning, which is not always standard, mm-hmm. um, rear cross traffic warning, all standard. Uh, I think but it's, it's expensive. Well. It's, it's, it starts around 31, goes up to about 50. Okay. So, so just, you Depending know. Depending on how okay. equipped. But I'm, I'm, right. I'm, I'm at the edge of my seat because I'm, mm. I'm dying to hear yeah. your assessment of I the car. Gas- so I got to say, it's, it, this reminds me, this is, so this started, this is a problem that started in Germany. I think it started with the X6, that BMW, where they sort of sliced off all the cargo space yep. on on a big SUV. And and it reminds me of, you guys know this this, this Ritter Sport, the, it's a cookie that sold in, in it's, it's a German like <laughs> oh, chocolate okay. cookie. Okay, yeah. And Going they call from, from it and they call it cookies. Ritter Sport. I know Sport. a Kringle. We're talking, we're talking no, Ritter it's Sport. called Ritter Sport and, <laughs> and it's a cookie and it says sport and it has like a bunch of calories and like 19 grams of sugar and like 30% of your saturated fat. It is not sport. So I think that maybe the word sport means something different in German. So you go to a you go to a, a furniture store and it says like couch sport or you go to the Berlin Zoo and, and it's like seat. sloth sport. <laughs> And this exactly. is why I like Keith no, Curry on talking I, I, cars. The problem this is, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, so our, the one that we rented, Volkswagen plastered the name Cross Sport right. on the side of it as sort of an advertising thing. So people know what it so is. So people know what it is. Um, but there already is a sporty car out there with this interior, with a great back seat, and with a lot of cargo space in the back. And it's called a sedan. It's called a Volkswagen Arteon, <laughs> which is what I drove last night. Actually. And all the praise that we lavished on this car is sort of conditional on the fact that it is large. One yeah. of the reasons that, that I like the Atlas is because it was great for how big it was. Right. But Always if you can, right? But if yeah. you can only sit five people and if you can only fit a small amount of cargo space, why are you getting, you know, around 20 miles a gallon? Why are you sitting up high? Why are you driving this big lumbering beast of a car if you can get that sportiness yep. out of a sedan? So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm with you here. I don't think that all SUVs are, are bad necessarily. Right, right. But when you take the rationale for why they exist and just have it be about an image, that that to me is is that that really really sours me on this on this yep. vehicle. You're so. holding out uh, the, the keys to the Atlas Sport and the Arteon. You say, Mike, you can go off on a long on a long road trip. I'm taking the Arteon. And, and if you're taking it. a yeah. lot of people, Every you're time. taking the regular Atlas. Or if you're coming back with antiques or mm-hmm. you know bringing a bunch of gear or something. Well, that's the question mm-hmm. I have. But yeah, yeah I, I will have to see. Will it will yeah. it have and, appeal beyond the state? And we'll, we'll be yeah. buying we'll be buying our own and, and testing it. Absolutely. And, and so Absolutely. We'll, we'll, so we'll have we'll stay have tuned we'll have more. That. We'll have more. So very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You gathered your thoughts. That was very nice. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so moving on to questions, as always, keep them coming. Talking cars at iCloud.com. The first one is a video question Ooh. from Daniel. Take a listen. Hi, talking cars. My question for you is. Whenever you get a next generation of a car come in for testing and you review it and you talk about it on the show, I hear you say things all the time like, well, you know, it, it lost a little bit of steering feel compared to the last generation. Given how many years it generally is between generations of cars and all the other cars you guys test in between and the shortcomings of human memory, how is it that you retain this information in order to compare the two generations to know, oh, well, you know, it lost like 5% of steering feel to be that specific. Are you just looking at old notes or you guys all have excellent memories? Thanks. So thank you, Daniel. And why I would love to say that it is indeed our <laughs> impeccable <laughs> memories that allow us to make these comparisons. I think it's a bit more than that, Mike. Right. So, so I, it, this this question brought up a, you know a conversation. I was like, how do we do this? And but it reminded me of how we handle a, a redesign. So, f- mm-hmm. and and what brought to my mind was the 2012 Honda Civic. Now, this car took a step backwards. The ride got worse. It got noisier. Oh, yeah. The mm-hmm. steering wasn't it wasn't very good. It was that no was long- the one that only lasted one generation. Right. It was, right. it was, it was so no bad. longer yeah. fun to drive, we and it tested yeah. it tested so poorly. Like for the first time. 
in like forever. Consumer Reports didn't recommend a Honda, Honda. Civic. Yeah. Mm. And Honda, of course, panicked. They went back to the drawing board and they fixed it. And the reason I know this, Daniel, is I looked it up. We have a database yeah. um, that encompasses just about every car we've ever tested, mm -hmm. going back decades. And um, so when, when new cars come online and we either rent them from a manufacturer for a first drive or we buy our own test cars, um, we're, we're always comparing it to how to where it came from. Is it, is it better or is it worse than the, than right. the model mm -hmm. that, it, that it replaced? Um, you know, uh, we, one of the, within the vehicles that got better, for example, was the Toyota Camry. Yeah. I mean, the Camry, to me, it, the steering got better. The handling got better. I think Toyota took that criticism mm -hmm. of, oh, your cars are boring to drive seriously, and they instilled a lot more lively steering in their vehicles. I mean, Keith and I are big fans of the Avalon, for yeah. example. Yeah. Um, and, and so they, 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 we, we look at it from, from a data standpoint in terms of fuel economy, the Camry's fuel economy right. got better yeah. compared to the last one. And the opinions yeah. aren't just one person's opinions. These exactly. are sort of, these are juries, these are numbers, these are, yeah. These uh, are. And, and so it isn't all just in our head. Right. It, it's also in our database and it, and it helps us you know, publish as extensively as we right. do. And I think it's important in the database is not just the numbers, mm -hmm. but the place for comments and why it was right. rated, why it was. And a resource for us and for our listeners and viewers is the web, you know, the web. We have model pages right. for the used versions exactly. as well. Exactly. So we can go back and get the character and say, you know, even if we can't say exactly why the numbers were mm -hmm. different, we can certainly go back and read in, those. In, in, our, and, used, and, in our used car information, and strike our memories, yeah. we would say to Consumer Reports members, avoid the 2012 Honda Civic. Right. Look for a 2013 right. or 2014 because mm. right. it got better. Right. And some, some vehicles too, you just, you, you drive enough from the brand that you know right. that there's a bit of a, a reputation. So I think Mazda and steering is a good mm -hmm. example that the steering feel is different. Yep. We've driven a lot of Mazdas, all of us. Yep. Right. And then all of a sudden they just, they just started feeling a little bit different right. yep. in this, in this latest round that's come out. Right. We, we've often used, even on, on talking cars, it's not Mazda-like or BMW-like mm -hmm. right. because mm -hmm. there's an expectation for the brand as well. So yeah. great question, Daniel. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Paul. I'm interested mm -hmm. in buying a one or two-year-old used car to save money, but I'm concerned about warranty. If something breaks on a used car, can I still go to the dealership to get it fixed under the manufacturer's warranty? Or does the warranty get voided once there's a transfer in ownership? Keith? The short answer is that almost every time you buy a used car that is still under its original manufacturer's warranty, that you'll be able to go to the dealership and get it fixed. Now, there are some, uh, you know, uh, restrictions apply, buyer beware. Right. It depends on a lot of things. So, for example, uh, some Hyundai vehicles, some hybrid vehicles will have uh, one portion of their warranty that's very, very long. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if the car is transferred to another owner, that warranty stays, but it gets shorter. So right. it goes from 10 years to five years or lifetime warranty in a battery to a 10 year warranty in a battery. Um, sometimes there are um, uh, different warranties that you can get uh, after the fact. And that is where things change here. So a certified pre-owned car right. is often something that the manufacturer claims that the dealer has gone through and done a, a huge inspection on. And, you know, we've looked into that. And sometimes mm -hmm. that inspection isn't as... as Thorough. Exactly. <laughs> you said it. But the one thing you can get from that is usually right. a longer warranty. And sometimes if you buy a one or two year old car that's certified pre-owned, you can get a longer warranty than someone who bought it new. Backed by the factory. Backed by the right. factory. That's right. the that's And the you can bring that part. to any dealer from right. the same brand. Right. Now sometimes dealers will add on their own little warranties like lifetime oil changes or lifetime this or lifetime mm -hmm. something. Those, there's a lot of fine print on all of those. The same goes for if you're buying a third party warranty, right. uh, which we found aren't always a great bet especially on reliable cars and those are kind of basically just they're they're just uh backed by a company that will pay for a portion or potentially all of a repair no matter mm -hmm. where it's done uh, those those are a lot of fine print but the long story short 
is if you buy a reliable car right. that does well in our reliability mm -hmm. ratings, you're probably not going to need the warranty. Right. Particularly on a one or two year old car, as, as Paul's looking at. Yeah, right. on, a, on, on a one <laughs> or two year not. old car. Yeah. Exactly. And on a one or two year old car, it probably has some factory warranty left. And you can actually yep. see that if you if you look at, say, you know, the Carfax or something, it'll even sometimes show you, yep. uh, uh, you know, the in-service date of the car, because it isn't by model year. It's by the in-service right. date of the car. Right. But, I'm sorry. As you, yeah. You're so right about about the, yeah. the the fine print, because several years ago, Chrysler made a big deal about their lifetime powertrain warranty. Mm -hmm. The fine print on this was that. Um, it was not transferable. Yeah. yeah. So obviously the smart people in Chrysler looked at this and said, okay, well, our average owner keeps their cars X number of years yeah. and then they, they move it on. Right. Yeah. So, so they weren't really risking. Lifetime for one. Yeah, they weren't yeah. really risking as much as it probably sounded like. And also several years ago, we did a survey that showed about 55% of owners who purchase an extended warranty. Mm -hmm. This is more, more for a new car, but still right. the same logic applies. Yeah. Um, so 55% said they hadn't used it for repairs during the lifetime of the policy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so buy a reliable car, right. check the in-service date because just because it's a 2019, it could have gone in service in late 2017. We have 2021s right. here exactly. that we've purchased. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So check that to make sure yeah. it isn't by the date of the car and consider a CPO, certified pre-owned car, if yeah. you want that extra warranty. It's, it's funny, it comes to light for Consumer Reports because as we've said, we buy all of our test vehicles and then ultimately sell them via different channels. Mm. But Consumer Reports is considered the first owner, even mm. though the cars only have sometimes five to 10,000 right. miles on it. Yeah. Some of those warranties don't go. So All it's right. kind of interesting. We see it certainly from this side. Our next question is from Sheila. My husband is not a particularly good driver. I'll just not say anything. And he's developed this <laughs> habit of driving with his left elbow propped up on the windowsill. I am not a fan of this behavior and re recently asked him not to do it when driving a rental car. But once we were back home, he picked the habit back up. Please give me a good reason he shouldn't drive like this. I can't believe this is the safe way to drive. <laughs> so my grandmother helped teach me to drive. Yeah. And when I started to drive like this, and she was she was a, a rather strict woman about right? certain things, and she said, Keith, it's better to be safe than to look cool. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, yeah. always better with both hands on the wheel. You know, we, we, we talk about teaching our young drivers mm -hmm. that nine and three and better control. But... In the reality, I do think it's valuable for people to be relaxed, attentive, but relaxed. Um, if you're on roads, you know, if you're on a freeway, et cetera, I do think of all the things that Sheila's husband or others could do, I think there's minor risk in that temporary. Yeah, if he's driving like this, right? Or, yeah, or you know, anything. driving like this, yeah, that's a problem. Well, you know, it's looking at his phone like, with his, you know, it's yeah. like we have a rental car. Stop doing that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I thought that was an interesting part of the question. No, you're, but you're right about teaching our kids. I mean, uh, uh, with, mm. with, with my my youngest is 16, so we're doing a lot of driver right. education, and he's he's very nervous, and I get it. And, but, I, but one of the things I say to him is like. Don't white knuckle it. Right. So you're at nine extreme, and three, right? and you're doing this. You just try to relax yeah. your hand. Uh, the more tense you are driving, the more fatigued you're going to get. Yeah. Mm. Uh, just like the the best, some of the good driving advice is also don't stare straight ahead while you're going on a long trip. Keep your Standing. eyes moving. Yeah. So keep your body moving. Keep you know change your position, change your posture, adjust the seat even. Reaction um, time. It's all about reaction exactly. time and all that. Should you have have an issue? Um, so the, my only thought on Sheila's question was, if they're in a rental car, are they in an unfamiliar location? Mm. So that would be my only thing. If you're, again, on roads you don't know, you don't know what's coming, maybe keeping both hands on the wheel for all these reasons we talk about is a good thing. But I do think there's a balance there. But, but the, it, and the way that you introduced the question was sort of funny. You're talking about, you know, spouses. And, yeah. You know, we, we could do a whole talking cars oh, yeah, on we that could. one. <laughs> of bad habits. <laughs> but if he's not a particularly good driver anyways, <laughs> yeah. potentially this is In someone Sheila's who mind. can, exactly, right. someone who can, who can benefit from a little more attentiveness behind right. the wheel in general. In general. In general. So, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that helps you, Sheila. Yeah. So our fourth question is from Tom. 
I drive a Kia Nero EV, and I'm constantly having other drivers flash their headlights at me. They're saying, nice car, Tom. <laughs> nice EV. Could be, but yeah. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Thinking I have high beams on. Mm. My car has LED mm. headlights, which I have adjusted a few times, but this seems to be an LED issue. Why can't the auto industry, which is always going on about advanced safety, produce a safe and effective headlight, especially one that does not cast thousands of dollars to replace? And Tom, we just happen to have our <laughs> headlight expert right here. Mm. So so I thank you. I thank you. So um, it's very, the timing of this question from Tom is kind of interesting. For those of you who don't know, when we test a product, any product, not just cars, and the manufacturers have concerns, particularly it happens when we've rated something low, mm -hmm. um, they are allowed to come look at the vehicle to say, you know, we even sometimes show the test result, like here it is, you know, and they, they have concerns. We recently had this on, on a vehicle we tested where it had a poor headlight rating and they were looking for the whys. Because they um, want to improve it. So it, it was interesting. In, yeah. yeah, they want to yeah. improve it. It's all good. It's good for yeah. consumers and, mm -hmm. and, and et cetera. So anyway, I, I asked them specifically, what is the drive to adding LED headlights? We've mentioned on this show, it, it's much more prevalent even on mainstream, even on low-cost vehicles that we're seeing the LEDs. And they said three things. Life. You don't have to worry about you know, replacing bulbs, mm -hmm. et cetera. Though the replacement, to, to Tom's point, of the unit is more expensive. If there's a crash and a or crash, something. Yep. Power consumption. They they indicated to me that LEDs as a technology have lower power consumption. Though they alluded to the fact that as they add more of them, they're creeping towards what the old halogens right. would hmm. be. And styling. Because the point source is small, it allows the stylist to do these funky arrangements in terms of styling. To answer Tom's question, they are more light. They are a brighter, whiter light, and there's simply more of it. So they, when you combine that with these sharper cutoffs, and when I say that, it's the transition between light and darkness at the top of that low beam pattern. And you approach that car either um, on an uneven road, if you, it's an SUV like the Nero and you're in a lower stance mm -hmm. vehicle, if they're even following you, it gives the impression as you cross that cutoff line that these LEDs are flashing you. Yeah. Sometimes if you go converse. over a bump, it looks like they're, they're flashing. Right. And, yeah. And, and it, and it doesn't just happen with, with LEDs. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I was driving our, our Jeep. Uh, Gladiator the other uh, the other week it's at night. Mm -hmm. um, these are halogens. Yeah. Um, and a lot of uh, oncoming drivers thought my high beams were on. Right. I'm like I, I looked at the instrument panel. Yes, like no, the lows sure. the lows are on. So it it, does, it 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 can happen with all different even types of vehicles. As, as well as different types of, of lenses. Right. And Tom has said alignment is key. Right. You can, you know, there's a big range of allowable alignment. If you're tweaked, those lamps are slightly high, you're going to see this even more. Tom has said he's already adjusted them. And we've adjusted the ones like the Gladiator that you've been in before mm -hmm. we tested it. Mm -hmm. So even with that, I had an interesting, we have a relative visiting from Alaska. And we were driving the other night and he said, oh, there's an LED that must be a police officer. And I said, what? He says, yeah, when we see those bright white lights in Alaska, we know they're a police officer. And I said, that's not the case, certainly here in Connecticut. And, and I think perhaps they have older vehicles and the LEDs are not so prominent where he is in Alaska as they are maybe here on the Northeast. So it was very interesting. So there's, we're not quite where all the vehicles are LEDs. We still see that mix. People pick them out and believe them to be high beams. So Tom, you are not alone. Keep your alignment good. Um, and again, you may be subject to this because there's a balance of wanting mm. to see further ahead, but balancing glare. Now, aside from that, that, that thousands of dollars to replace, there are some solutions that are on the, on the horizon, so right. to speak. Uh, and it's those, the adaptable beam headlights, right. which we're starting to see in Europe. They're very expensive, yes. but these are essentially um, headlights that can either uh, put a shutter over a portion of the lights, or it can mm. sometimes even move the lights a little bit. It can it can disable individual LEDs. Yes. It needs to, yeah. So basically yeah. there's a there's a camera looking out or a sensor's looking yeah. out. It sees where oncoming cars are coming in. Yeah. And it it basically 
dims the beam for the right. oncoming drivers right. only in their field of vision. Right. That's not going to solve your cost problem and go back to the days of right. square headlights or round headlights. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But sealed beams. Sealed beams, exactly. But it will, I think, we're in this sort of interesting regulatory phase where yes. th where those are already legal in, in Europe, but they're not legal in right. the United States and right. there's still this long comment period about it. So yeah. we've written about that a lot at consumerreports.org. So if you want to search uh, search for uh, adaptive headlights, you can learn about those. And, and to your point, headlights are no longer just a sealed beam. You get what you get. Right. Mm. There's options mm -hmm. on all, nearly all vehicles, be it halogen on the base car and an LED. We, I know it sounds crazy, but we said, if that's a concern, do a night drive. See which ones are more pleasing to you, depending on where and, and how you drive. So, And, and as yeah. you've accurately pointed out, getting the higher cost light isn't always better. Right. So, so I right. think that, LEDs that's, are not, that's interesting. We have never said unequivocally that LEDs are better than right. halogen. There's it, good and bad of both. And as you, you started answering this question, you said, you know, no question that, that it, in this case, you're, 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 you, the LEDs are, are bright, they're whiter, they're, yep. they're doing all these things. It's another example, I think, in the automotive world where you have technology that takes steps forward but also take step backwards. Right, right. You're getting this, but you're giving up this. And then eventually it might reach that equilibrium right, right. as we figure it out. And yeah. the cost may come down as yeah. they increase in popularity, which they continue to do. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we've helped you, Tom. That will do it for this episode of Talking Cars. As always, keep listening, keep watching, keep the questions coming. Mm -hmm. Talking Cars at iCloud.com. And we will see you next time.